Um, I was uh, sitting backstage composing a list of all the people that I knew, both intimately and peripherally, who were uh, more worthy of uh, being here than I, and I had to stop eventually, because um, I was starting to feel a little bit bad about myself. Because uh, uh, I actually have no earthly right to be here, because um, in addition to being a complete uh, idiot, um, I'm also venal and shallow. So. Um, that's an incredibly hard act to follow, that green thing. I just want to take it home. But this seems somewhat appropriate to the larger theme um, of the conference. What is the sound of one hand shopping? Our waiter is looking wistful, his eyes cast downward the merest hint of a smile playing gently upon his lips. He's about to share something with us. We lean forward, expecting perhaps a treasured but bittersweet memory, perhaps a tale of heedless young lovers in Paris, the specter of war looming. Instead, he begins, there's a really lovely story about the calzone on tonight's menu. This is a temple of food, a well-known restaurant in Northern California. There is a sense of occasion just in being here, an awestruck thrill on the diners' faces as if we have been chosen for something miraculous, like the people massed in the desert at the end of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. <laughs> and indeed, the meal is an undeniable pleasure. The impeccable ingredients in each dish is the platonic ideal of itself. Oh, and for dessert, one fresh date and a just-picked local tangerine, both perfect. In the same elegiac calzone voice our waiter further confides in us, we'd like to encourage you to bruise the orange leaf between your fingers. <laughs> we nibble our delicious dates. As instructed, we crush the orange leaves, and the airborne oils create a lovely perfume that mingles with the steam of our post-supper coffee. Smiles of mutual congratulation beam from table to table. <laughs> Glasses are raised in celebration of what exactly? Why, of our elevated capacities, our fine palates that can appreciate a dessert of a single date. So very different from the cratered, preservative, strafed mouths of the masses, don't you think? <laughs> I overhear one bartender say to the other, yeah, I think I'm just going to stay in this weekend and roast garlic. <laughs> Woohoo! The man of a departing couple leans in and he says something to his companion. She listens and gives an almost electric start. Like Warren Beatty and Diane Keaton in Reds, who caught up in the joyous throngs of the 10 days that shook the world, had no choice after witnessing something so glorious and world-changing, but to race home and fuck each other silly, the man and woman share a look of smoldering, unbridled lust. What did he whisper? I was just told that they hadn't served that vinegar in 24 years. <laughs> Lenny Bruce once described flamenco as being an art form wherein a dancer applauds his own ass. There's a lot of flamenco going around the room tonight. <laughs> Subtleties of flavor previously thought non-existent, or at the very least nonsensical, are now the subject of earnest interrogation, covering just about anything you put into your mouth. In the food section of the New York Times, a journalist writing about Fleur de Sel had this to say about the sea salt that is harvested in France and available in New York City for $36 a kilo. Quote, as I ate them, Fine crystals of salt sprinkled on the potatoes crackled under my teeth, releasing tiny bursts that tasted of the sea and its minerals. There was no sting at the back of my mouth, no bitterness, just a silky, salty essence wrapping each bite of potato. Sting at the back of the mouth? Bitterness? What has this poor woman been doing all these years to add some savor to her food? Has she been licking undeveloped Polaroids? <laughs> Mm. 
The general New York Times reader enjoys the privileges and plenitude of life in the world's wealthiest country, so articles on rolling cigarettes out of pocket lint or recipes on salvaging that last bit of rotting pork would make no sense. But is it completely naive to think that a squib in the same newspaper about ice cubes frozen from a river in the Scottish Highlands and overnighted to your doorstep, the perfect complement to your single malt, necessarily demands, if for no other reason than to preserve some vague notion of karmic balance, a prefatory note that such a service even exists? Surely, when we've reached the point when we're fetishizing sodium chloride and water and subjecting both to the kind of scrutiny we used to reserve for choosing an oncologist, it's time to admit that the relentless questing for that next undetectable gradation of perfection has stopped being about the thing itself and crossed over into a realm of narcissism so overwhelming as to make the act of masturbation look selfless. <laughs> Back at the temple of food, peevish and ungracious though it may seem, I am desperate to ask somebody the question, just how fucking good can olive oil get? <laughs> I will stipulate to having a bottle of French sea salt and a big bottle of extra virgin olive oil in my kitchen. And while the presence of both might go some small distance in pigeonholing me demographically, they are mute and useless indicators of the content of my character. Neither of them makes me a good person, or at least I used to think so. Since anyone with taste buds will respond to the trans fat bells and whistles of a hot fudge sundae or super nachos, how better then to show nobility of spirit than by broadcasting an easily bruised delicacy? Such a perfectly tuned instrument can quickly suss out the cheap and the nasty. So, the bitterness at the back of the throat, the polite refusal of the glass of whiskey marred by those domestic ice cubes, <laughs> the physical and psychic insult that are sheets of anything short of isotopic density. What is the thread count, Kenneth? <laughs> We've become an army of multiply chemically sensitive high maintenance princesses trying to make our way through a world full of irksome peas. There are those among you who might argue with the mater materials focused upon, cotton, salt, oil, Water are themselves so basic, so very much the opposite of a ski chalet in Stad, for example, that such Epicurean monasticism is itself an act of humility by association. The temporal and the vulgar rejected in favor of what really most matters in life. And what is it that most matters in life? Well, here's a hint. It's a pronoun that can be effectively conveyed without any words at all. Just take your index finger and Point it to the center of your chest, an inch and a half from your precious, precious heart. I once tutored adult literacy at a men's shelter for about two years. Have no fear, this is not going to be one of those Capra-esque anecdotes with a lachrymose moral like, you know, there are those who might say that I taught Tito, but if you ask me, it's Tito who taught me. <laughs> I only tell you this to tell you the following story. <laughs> Christmas was coming and Sylvia, the amazing woman who ran the career center, mentioned that a lot of guys in the program were going to see their kids, wives, girlfriends, etc. for the first time since getting back on the road to recovery. Even a small token would go a very long way in repairing relationships that had been very sorely tested over the years. So I called up a friend of mine who raided the giveaway closets of the various glossy women's magazines at which she worked, eventually filling up two very large boxes with fancy cosmetics and toiletries, more than enough for all of the men to arrive bearing gifts. Sylvia went through the boxes, setting aside those things she thought might be less than suitable. When I looked over what she had discarded, I saw that, without exception, she had taken out the big ticket, really expensive items showing me the exorbitant bottle of witch hazel with its unadorned text-heavy label like a purgative tonic from an old dispensary and the bar of soap resembling a rough gray river stone wrapped up in brown paper and tied with wax twine, she said, they're not going to understand that these things are fancy. They're going to think that the guys got the medicine from a drugstore. It would look like the very opposite of a present. These things just look, she searched for the word, poor. 
These people are already poor. Why would they want to be reminded of that? Well, clearly Sylvia and the men of the Bowery Mission had no appreciation for the soul-cleansing charms of Kiel's blue astringent. What might they make of other such high-end examples of commodified folk poverty, like the wallpaper from Scalamandre called the Rogoshevsky Scroll, named after the family who occupied one of the apartments in the building that now houses New York City's Lower East Side Tenement Museum. The design is a faithful copy of the wallpaper they found when they renovated. A pretty floral pattern. It must have put up a valiant fight against the grime and cold water squalor of the place. It's nice to think that those Rogoshevskys, fortunate enough not to have had to pitch themselves out of burning shirtwaist factory windows, were cheered by the sight of it when they got home from their 15-hour shifts. The Rogoshevsky scroll is available to the trade for upwards of $80 a roll. Or how about the armchair called the favela, named for the jury-rigged, destitute, crime-ridden shantytowns that climb the hills in Rio de Janeiro that you saw earlier today. According to the IFC, the average yearly income for a family in the Brazilian favelas is around $860. The favela armchair retails for over $3,000. Oh, Sylvia, I want to say. Don't you know that if you curl your lip enough, you can make poor sound just like pure? <laughs> it's nice to have nice things. Creature comfort is not some bourgeois capitalist construct, but framing it as a moral virtue sure is. It's what the French call nostalgie de la boue, nostalgia for the mud. Two things have to be in place to really appreciate this particular brand of gluttony posing as asceticism. First, you have to have endured years and years of plenty, decades of such surfeit under your belt that you've been fortunate enough to grow sick of it all. And second, and this is what really separates the men from the boys, in order to maintain a life free of clutter and suitable for a sacred space, you'll need another room to hide your shit. <laughs> and it is shit, ultimately, or some corporeal effluvial cousin thereof. This sloughing off and scouring down to the walls is about a denial that has little to do with doing without. It's not so much the foregoing of one's fleshly desires as much as a terrified repudiation of the essential nature of what we are. Great, sloshing, suppurating bags of wet, prone to rupture, mortal messes just waiting to happen. And who wants to be reminded of that? There's an apocryphal story attributed to Diana Freeland that tells of a young woman who was working as an editor, done dirt by her man, throws herself in front of the IRT. She lives, uh, but is packed off to some swanky booby hatch like Payne Whitney or Austin Riggs where she can get better. And returning to her job months later, shaky, she is called into Mrs. Freeland's office. The arbitrix of style rises from her chair and taking the wounded bird's hands in both of hers offers precisely this advice on avoiding life's oozier and less attractive reality. My dear, she says, here at Vogue magazine, we don't throw ourselves in front of trains. If we must, we take pills. Thank you. <laughs>